I'm a molecular biologist, biochemist who works at the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution. Uh, are we alone? In the cosmos? You and I are together, but that does not imply, that's not an answer to the question you were asking. I, you know, don't know whether we're alone, the human species is alone, or life on Earth is alone in the cosmos. I hope not, and there are reasons to suspect not. You hope not? I hope not. Why do you hope that we're not alone? Yeah, I think it would be more interesting to find, well, certainly as a scientist, right, you expect a second example of life that would be, have an independent origin. origin. You do expect that? Well, if we could find one, you asked me why I hoped, so if we could find one, uh -huh. It would provide a lot of scientific insights on what life is, how it works. Right now, we're kind of constrained because pretty much everybody that we have access to, both all the way from other human beings down to microbes, more or less has the same biochemistry. You said down to have. microbes. You yes, look down, down to microbes? microbes? I do. <laughs> why, do you, why do you do that? You don't well, like microbes? We're single cell. Well, it's the food chain, right? So you're, they're at the bottom of a food chain, which we, of course, eat at the top of the food chain. So we can say down the food chain, I suppose. So viruses are on top of the food chain because well, uh, yeah. fungi are they're going to eat us when we die, so they're on the top of it? Viruses, if you look at them evolutionarily, really are associated with the organism that they infect, so it's very hard to distinguish the virus from its okay. host. All right, let me ask you again. Are we alone? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Okay. And uh, why do, what would you need to do, if I gave you a hundred billion dollars to try to help, an, uh, the caveat, have to ha an, help answer this question, what would, how would you spend the money? Yeah, well, I did write a book on this, you know. Yeah, okay. This book, Life, the Universe, and the Scientific Method, I wrote this is because my son at the time was in eighth grade and was being asked to do science fair projects in the American public school system where you were expected uh, the correct scientific poster was one that was hypothesis based uh -huh. associated with a single experiment where if the experiment went this way you mm -hmm. confirmed the hypothesis and if the experiment went the other way you denied the hypothesis. Yes. So I wrote this whole book to try to explain first that the hypothesis-based research strategy is very, very impotent in asking big questions where, of course... Asking or answering? Or asking them, That's even. Good. So, and the big question that we focused the book on was, are we alone in the cosmos? We, so he helped you write it. Well, he, he did the proof for it, yes. So, so well, I mean, I, I had an audience, so, okay. so, so my wife has never read the book, but my kid has read oh, most gosh. of it. So. So the question is, how do scientists go about asking the question, are we alone in the cosmos? Mm -hmm. And so there is a series of chapters which show how you approach this question when you can't ask the question directly. Right. Right? The direct question would be to get, go travel to some place where there is life and look at it. Now the problem is that we can't travel. and we, If we could travel, we don't know where to go. So what happens is uh, we do indirect experiments. But that's not the first time in science, right? I mean, Galileo, who you could argue is sort of the founder of modern scientific method, wanted to talk about the Earth going around the sun. Now, he wasn't able to observe that directly. So what he did instead was roll balls down inclined planes and set pendulums in motion. And when he did that, he was addressing the question, does the Earth go around the sun? Okay, so I'm giving you $100 billion. What do yeah. you do with it? So, I mean, so the first thing that you do with, uh, I mean, $100 billion is an interesting number, which I guess comes from the fact that we have 10 fingers. It does, but, does. But uh, yeah, so the first thing you do is you try to understand as much as you can about the life on Earth. And so you try to look at the biosphere that we have and go back in time to infer what ancient biospheres look like. So how are you going to do it? Well, that's done. It's being done. I mean, it's not a matter of going to do it. So people are sequencing genomes from lots well, of. I'm organisms. giving you a hundred billion dollars. What are you? How are you going to spend yeah, it? Yeah. So, so, so for much less than we'll have money left over for the other four parts of this quadrant. So let okay. me. So okay. this is only going to cost about seven billion dollars, which is, of course, is to strategically. It's happening now. Sequence the planetary genome to understand the. I mean, all organisms on Earth. The ones we can find, absolutely, and then infer from that what ancient organisms look like at the level of their genome, what proteins they made, what metabolisms they did. And we've actually done that. I mean, we have resurrected proteins. You can then, once you know, it's like Indo-European, right? So when you look at the sequences of descendant languages, you can infer the, the structures of words in the common ancestor, just like with modern genetics, 
we can sequence genes and proteins from modern life and infer the sequences of genes and proteins in ancient organisms. Well, when and we do that, for example, in the Weiss paper that yes. just came out, uh, what do we find out about the first, first organisms? Well, I mean, we don't agree with most of what's in that Weiss paper, but we did this in 1990. There's a paper that was published in PNAS, and what you do is discover a couple things. First, you can bring experimental methods to bear on those hypotheses. You can actually, with biotechnology, resurrect ancient genes and proteins and study them in the laboratory. So Isn't that what you do when you create a phylogenetic tree? You well, you're resurrecting you, you, them by finding the common ancestor but, between the two, and then well, you the two, and then the two, and the two, and the two, and you just keep on going. Yeah, but you infer the sequence of the common ancestors. But then you need biotechnology to actually synthesize a gene that encodes that ancestor, oh. and then express that gene in a bacteria, and then isolate the actual oh, protein. I see, I see. So we've done that for very ancient, ancient bacteria. And what happens in the ancient bacteria is that we know that those proteins are active, optimally, at about 65 degrees. Centigrade. Eric Gaucher's group has been doing this also with ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. So we can measure, this is an, a protein that's Wait, wait, involved. you're not allowed to say words like that, but that's go ahead true, and repeat yeah. it again. This is a protein that's involved in fixing carbon dioxide. It's what plants do ah, when they photosynthesize. Yes. And what happened, of course, over the history of Earth is the amount of oxygen in the air increased and increased, and the biochemistry associated with it, managing that oxygen and the carbon dioxide associated with it changed, and she has resurrected proteins going back 300, oh, well, sorry, say well, 3 billion years to understand the interaction between. Wait, wait, when you sequence, when you sequence, when you do the phylogenetic tree and you find out uh, an early protein, right. mm -hmm. uh, then you say, hey, this is to take in carbon dioxide. Right. So you assume, therefore, there used to be carbon dioxide. That's right. And you got the 65 degree temperature from what? Well, okay, so what one does, well, this is a different protein, but we know that 3 billion years ago, the life that we have on Earth then was making proteins by ribosome-based translation, right? The DNA makes an RNA molecule, the RNA molecule then encodes proteins. And there are pieces of that system. One of them is called elongation factor, which we build a tree. We infer the sequence of the elongation factor in the last common ancestor of all bacteria. Maybe it lived three billion years ago. We then use the magic of recombinant DNA technology, biotechnology, to bring that ancient protein back to life. And then we study what temperature it prefers to function at. And it prefers to function at 65 degrees centigrade. That's a hot spring. It's not a super hot spring. It's not one of these hyper thermophile gas vents at the bottom of the ocean. But it's a warm Yellowstone hot spring. And this is the environment where the ancient organism, the bacteria that was the ancestor of all modern bacteria, was living. Can you tell whether it was living in fresh water or salt water? You can. What That's was right. It? Well, I mean, the answer is it's living in roughly isotonic semi-salt water. So you're, you're living in salt water yourself if you actually right, look right. at the concentration of salt in your body. It's roughly that. So, so yeah, so, so there's a, another question is how do you interact with the atmosphere? Well, the Number one interaction with the atmosphere is this fixing of carbon dioxide from the air by plants as they make more plant, right? They make sugar, they make food. So, so you know, if you resurrect ancient proteins going back three billion years, you can follow the ancestral interaction between ancient plants and the ancient atmosphere. And so what we're learning is a couple things. The first thing is the temperature and environment of the system, okay? The second is that you know, there's an increasing role of RNA in those living organisms as you go back in time. And this is the foundation for the RNA world, right? The RNA world is a statement that if you go back in time, when translation was invented, when proteins were first made, it was made by, they were made by an organism that used RNA as the only genetic part of biological catalysis metabolism was managed by an RNA world. So you're telling me that ribosomes are not made out of DNA? The ribosomes are made out of RNA. Not well, DNA. That's correct. So Could you make a ribosome out of DNA? Nope. We, people have tried that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever seen a UFO? I have never seen a UFO. I've never seen an unidentified see flying a... object? <laughs> no, sorry. I want to desperately, but no. What do you know about aliens? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing about it. Well, so that's great. So if you read the book, okay, the opening page is a line from a, uh, a book by the, called The Puppet Master by Robert Heinlein, where 
you know, the, uh, the puppet master. Have you seen this book? This is a... I haven't, I haven't. Well, this is a, it's a, they've made it into a wonderful movie. But the exchange goes between a government operative who's played by Eric Tall and an exobiologist. The uh, operative says, what do you do? The exobiologist says, we decide what alien life might look like. And the government operative says, wait a minute, that sounds like guesswork. How do you make a living at that? Mm -hmm. And then the exobiologist says, yes, some people say that we're the only science without a subject matter. So what you must do when you talk about aliens, what alien life would look like, is do these indirect approaches, like Galileo, right? You're not going to observe the Earth going around the sun. You're going to roll balls down slopes. You're going to mm -hmm. swing pendulums. Or you're going to try to, for example, construct your own alien form of life in the laboratory. That's what synthetic biologists do to try to understand, you know, what... When I ask a lot of people yeah. whether we're alone in the universe, they say probably not. And the reason yeah. they give is because we have recently found well, the universe might be uh, spatially infinite. Our observable universe is gigantic. Yes. And there's lots and lots of rocky planets there. Yep. They're probably Earth-like. And uh, that's why they say we're probably not alone. But the problem with that answer is that it ignores what's the probability of life yeah. on these planets. Oh. Now, I think you are probably more informed about the difficulties with assessing the probability for their origin of yeah. life than oh. most other people, or well. almost anybody I know. So let me ask you this question. What, what do we know about this probability of life originating on these other wet, rocky right. planets? So you, you don't have astronomical numbers, if I may use that word. I mean, you have 10 to the 11th galaxies and 10 to the 11th stars per galaxy, say one rocky planet per star. So that's 10 to the 22. That's an astronomical number. No, it isn't. Oh, well, you're <laughs> dealing with Avogadro's number. You're normalizing yeah, Avogadro. Uh, exactly. Well, I mean, the, it's an interesting. So now the next question is, we do have. Go ahead. We do have uh, 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 more information. We do know that life ar arose here. And also, we know that the sun has, shall we say, five billion years of productive history. Our case, life is certainly here before 10% of that history has been used up. I mean, it's interesting. 90% of the life of the star has been used up to get intelligence, at least what you and I would call intelligence. So you can make the argument that if we had been a little bit slower to get intelligent life, the star would be gone or we would have turned into a red giant. It's not, 90, it's not 90, it's 50. Oh, well, it depends on where you consider the sun to have expanded to make the Earth no longer in the habitable that's right, zone. That's right. so that's then then you're right, then it's 90. But who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. But the point is that life on Earth emerged in 10 per, It only took 10% of the time. Or less, maybe 1%. Yeah, or even less, exactly. And so that's the argument for, and since there's a, I think 10 to the 22 rocky planets is not a bad number to, to, as a guess for what there is available to work with. So I, the fact that on Earth, we had life in the, with within five or ten percent of the life the, of the time that we have available, mm -hmm. means that we are probably not alone cosmically. Now, so you think so? It happened life, rapidly, therefore it's likely. That's it happened rapidly on Earth. That's right. So, and you've got stars. You know, some of these brown dwarfs that are relatively stable. Uh, they, they'll last a lot longer. So, when you're going to go look for intelligent life, now that's likely to be scarce in the universe because it took so long on Earth to get to the point. You would go look uh, around a, a, a star with a longer intrinsic lifetime. So how, many, how much more likely is it to find life than it is to find human-like technological yeah, so life? I think it's quite likely on a rocky planet like Earth. I wish Mars were a little bit bigger and I wish Venus were a little bit colder. <laughs> but otherwise, I think it's quite likely, especially if you were to get access to a solar system that is not ours, yeah. this is what this exoplanet is all about. I, I suspect that the, the chances you will find is no 90% of the exoplanets that are like Earth are going to have microbial life on them. Really? Yeah. So you suspect that we're not alone? Well, not alone, and that's how we started this conversation, right? Whether you're alone in the sense of where you're happy to have a microbe someplace else. Yes. Now, whether we're alone... Are you, are you happy to have a microbe? I would be desperately enjoying having a microbe from an alien origin to study in the lab. So this isn't absolutely. just your intrinsic optimism talking. It's, oh, this no, is... no, not at all. If you want to know my optimism, I would... No, you no, I want to know your answers. scientific yes. answers first, and I'll ask you yeah. about your emotional <laughs> appeal. <laughs> exactly. So you think that it's 90% of these rocky, right. wet planets will have some type of life on yeah. them. Yeah. 
and the argument here is the universality of physical law, right? And, and, and to which we include chemical law. If you are on Earth and the inventory of water is what it was when the solar nebula collapsed, and it's going to be that's going to be a universal uh, scaled for the size of the solar nebula, whether you get a big star or a small star. Yeah, I mean, you're getting on Earth within five percent, ten percent of the life of the star, you get microbes. It's going to be everywhere. So I, I sometimes ask the question, what fraction of these rock, wet, rocky planets will have uh, English language on them? <laughs> none. <laughs> All right. So most people say none. They have no problem with that. But right. when they have life, you just said 90%. So what makes you think that life, as we know it on Earth, is less quirky and more generic than English language? Well, but because I mean, you didn't ask me, for example, I mean, ribonuclease, which is a protein found in the stomach of oxen that digest RNA, has an amino acid chain, lysine, glutamic acid, threonine, alanine, alanine, alanine. Yes, I have memorized it, so I can keep going. 123 amino acids. Now you have to ask me. Wait, wait. You can remember? Go ahead. Go ahead. Give me 20. K e t a a a k f e r q h m d. You can go check it out. All right. So these these are the amino acids. Uh, one letter code for the okay. amino acids. So now, if you ask me, is there a ribonuclease somewhere else in the cosmos? Sure. If, is there one with that sequence? No. And that has to do with astronomical numbers, right? So what is the chance that there's a word in another language meaning sun? Pretty good. What is the chance that it is S-U-N? Well, the answer is not so likely. What is the chance of somebody speaking English exactly with your accent? Very, very like, unlikely. Right. What's the chance of somebody speaking English in general? Much, much, much more likely. But Charlie, there you are talking about combinatorial astronomical well, numbers. Well, what I'm doing saying right. is like there's something really, you just said, oh, there's something even more quirky, and yeah. that's not what I'm talking about. Well, I can so more quirky <laughs> than English. In other words, the quirk yeah. doesn't have a meter on it. Oh, it metric. does. A well, metric. You, so the metric is easy enough. So let's just start small. How many, how many proteins are there? With 20 amino acids, but you're assuming that the and you're assuming that the aliens will have amino acids. Well, let's assume that. I mean, the space becomes larger, and the probability becomes quirkier. Well, what fraction? I, what fraction of them will have amino acids? Will it be? Well, let's assume. That, let's assume that they all of them, right? English I'll is none of them. a singular, right? So a specific sequence, K E T A A A, is 20 times 20 times 20. So. 100 amino acids in a row, 20 to the 100th power is 10 to the 130th, which well, is larger than the number of atoms in the... And well, that's it's, truly it's, But it's much more quirky if amino acids is only one billionth of a trillionth of the uh, components of a yeah, life form, right? Yeah, so you asked me about English, and English, the probability of a language existing is very high, the probability of English existing a language. is very, Sorry. A, a language, so of which English is an, one of trillions of astronomical. The probability of a language is high. So, okay, let yes. me ask you the question. Yeah. What's the probability that on these 90% of wet rocky planets where you think there'll be life, yeah. that there will be language? Okay, very small. Very small. Exactly. So, I mean, bacteria, well, now we have to worry about language. Yes, what do you okay, mean by language? Okay. Bacteria <laughs> do talk to each other. They talk okay. to each other without semantics and without grammar. but. But you taking language to mean, right, to what we would mean as linguists, right? You're talking about the need for intelligent life. And since it took such a long time on Earth to get intelligent, linguist capable life, right, the sun, another half a billion years, and the sun would have made the Earth no longer habitable, give or take. So you're saying that you've wasted 90, 95% of the lifetime of the star before you got the first language on Earth. And that implies it's going to be very infrequent to come occur on other planets of circling stars of similar age limitations. Well, stars, there have been a lot of stars. Well, I won't, let me, let's not go too, I don't want to get too involved in the details, but what I want to get involved in is this question of the probability of life. Because yes. you have talked about some of the, what, bottlenecks to the origin yeah. of life. Yeah. Could you tell us about some of the bottlenecks? You know, you think that 90% of these rocky planets, wet rocky planets, will have life, so therefore these bottlenecks that you've been talking about, you, they're not that narrow a bottleneck. <laughs> right. Well, first place, the first discussion we've had is basically Bayesian statistics for the, for the amateur, right? We are, we are taking what we know about the life on Earth and from that trying to infer general probabilities. And Bayes' theorem, we do this all the time, right? 
So now your second question is, ah, great. So we ascertain based on sort of this idea, you know, letting what little we know about the history of life on Earth and natural history in general, we've come to the conclusion that microbial life emerged quickly on Earth and therefore it's likely to be found universally throughout the cosmos. Now, your next problem, <laughs> you, now you ask the next question. Well, well, how the hell did it happen, right? So now that's a problem, and I can come up with all sorts of difficulties. So if it's that easy, why don't we just walk into the laboratory, mix a few test tubes, get a few molecules to bump into each other, and, and get it to happen? So we haven't been able to do we, that yet? Well, how many people are trying? Well, so Andy Ellington, my good friend and colleague, former student, in addition, you know, every time I say, you know, you know, we haven't gotten anything to crawl out of one of our test tubes and ask us to dance, and he says, well, we haven't been really trying. And most scientists don't try. In fact, if you read the book that I put together on this, right, when scientists try to understand origins, they try to tackle a simpler problem, a much better defined problem with pure chemicals, pure minerals, that nobody tries to build a model of the planet, Just put a few electron volts through the thousand electron volts through the atmosphere to create lightning and try to simulate early Earth and then see, then go check the soup and see if anything has come out in life. So that hasn't happened. People don't that's, that's the Yuri Milner experiment. Well, it's the first start of the Yuri Miller. Uh, so Stanley Miller, I mean, it's an interesting question. You, got, you know that Harold Yuri tried to prevent or dissuade Stanley from doing that experiment. Mm -hmm. So the question is whether we should not call it the Miller experiment, yeah, but yeah. never mind. Yeah, that's the first part. But what Miller did was he sparked atmospheres and got amino acids out. But I, he did not get, as far as I know, living bacteria coming out of that. And um, at that point, people have then sort of separated the problem. That's what scientists do, right? They take this big problem, this big complex system, and they try to look at parts of it. And so he looked at a part of it, but he did not have any rocks in that simulation. Mm -hmm. He did not have any serpentinization, no basalt, no volcanoes, no sulfur dioxide, no trace amounts of minerals like tourmalines that contain boron, which we think is very important for, for that process. So he didn't do any of the rest of the planet. He just looked at a piece of the atmosphere in a little glass tube. Yes. So and, he started. And that's what you're doing? Well, yeah, so we, no, this is of course one of the problems. We don't dare do the, I mean, this is Magrathea, right? You have to get Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and make you, a, build you a whole new planet to run the experiment again. But what we do is we add to this mix rocks and minerals and other gases that are likely to be present and try to understand the parameters of how those influence the outcome, hoping that we will get it. And the hope has been realized. I mean, we certainly have gotten much farther down the pathway towards Darwinian molecular systems than Stanley got. How, how much further? Well, I, you know, I think the John Templeton Foundation has gotten a group of us together, and we include a, you know, a geologist, an organic chemist, and then a number of people working with RNA, and then a downstream RNA proteins person. And I think after, you know, the, the, the Jim Simons at the Simons Foundation and, and it has also supported this, NASA supporting Wait, I didn't, ask, I didn't ask you how much money you I got. I asked you how much well, progress well, was, you made. I was reminded of your hundred billion. <laughs> no. Oh, well, you didn't ask that question either. <laughs> right. Well, but, I think but, you only spent like for, 1% of but it. But for about $20 million, I think we have now are in the position where we can say, we can see a general path, a, a connected hypothesis, not individual hypothesis, but if this and that, and then something that follows on, where we go from an atmosphere like Stanley Miller had, or, or something more updated for model, modern views of planetary atmospheres, we can get RNA out of it. I sort of see see how that will pan out. Now, this is Churchillian, right? I don't. This is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But I do think that we are at the end of the beginning in terms of understanding how you get life, Darwinian systems, out of. But you are known among colleagues for saying, okay, here's the problem, here's the problem, here's the problem, like the tar yes. problem you yes. talked about, and yeah. there are some other problems. Could you list those problems? Well, I hate to be a broken record, but if you read my book... I know, but <laughs> don't tell me to read the book. We're talking, this is an interview, it's a different media. <laughs> well, I got <laughs> it. Not the printed work. You need, yeah, exactly. you need to just summarize yeah, what our, it says in the book. Audience. Well, uh, what we argue is that the way that you address problems for which hypothesis-based research is not a good route. 
when you really have no idea as to what you're trying to do is you focus on paradoxes. So you come up not with ideas about how life could have emerged. You're supposed to play this game and explain to me how it is impossible for life to have emerged. So the paradoxes you're referring to, the tar paradox for your audience, is a well repeated, it's a paradox that arises from an often repeated experiment. You go into the kitchen, you leave the stove on too long, what comes out after you put too much energy into organic matter? Well, life does not emerge. Asphalt emerges, something better for paving. So, so you say, there, therefore, one ingredient is don't cook it too much. Yeah. So now then you have what, so, but the paradox is, you know, naturally, organic material will devolve to asphalt, coal, tar. At some point, you have to make the leap but don't you have to heat it up to have that happen? Well, you have to put energy into it, yes. But you know, if I, but if I leave it at room temperature, you also get asphalt. Just you get it at a slower rate. Oh, right? Okay, so that's the asphalt problem. Yeah. What are the so other the problems? asphalt problem means that at some point you have to somehow get Darwinian evolution out of a devolving organic material. So what else? What other problems? Okay, so now we have the water problem. The so water let's, problem. Let's assume there's you, water everywhere. Well, that's right, and we think that life is needs water. Okay. But let's just say, for sake of argument, you solve the asphalt problem. You manage to get a Darwinian biopolymer like DNA out of this or RNA. De, well, or RNA out of this devolving uh, organic material. Now, put it in water, what happens? Well, water corrodes it. Water breaks apart pieces of DNA, RNA. You survive it, even though you're as the Star Trek character point out, an ugly bag of mostly water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you survive because you're repairing the damage. And because nobody, I'm repairing the damage. Yeah, but you, plus I keep my DNA in a package oh, with no, less... Surrounded by water? Well, well, you, you do package it in chromatin <clears throat> when the, I, the hope is that the water has a little bit less access to destroy it, but that DNA is... So that's a Evolving. water problem. That's so you gotta, water. If you're going to create something like RNA or DNA, you have to protect it a little bit from water. That's even right. Even though it yeah. likes to be in water. Even though it can dissolve okay. in water, it has to operate in water. Tar problem, water problem, okay. what other problem? So let's say for sake of argument, you get RNA out, right? Okay, and you now, have it water. So I mean, you, know, you now, wrap it so it's okay So with this water. RNA has to do two things at the same time. It has to do genetics and it has to do metabolism. But you have what we now call, how do you get a molecule, the single biopolymer problem, how do you get one molecule to do both genetics and catalysis? Because Well, that's what the ribozyme is about. Well, right? yes, but a, a genetic molecule is supposed to lie out straight. It's as a... Uh, when it's red. It's a, as a template. But of course, it's not supposed to lie out straight when it functions. It's uh, supposed okay, to fold. Right. So how do you get a molecule that both folds and doesn't fold? Like well, one can go like that and then go back. And RNA and is a... Nice compromise, but proteins are not. Proteins just fold. And DNA, by the way, for the most part, just is a genetic molecule. So the argument has been that RNA is first in part because it makes a very good compromise between the need to fold mm -hmm. and the need sometimes and the need not to fold sometimes. And yes. There's a lot of other ways in which RNA makes that compromise. So that's the third well. problem is uh, you... This is single biopolymer product. So now let's say you get an RNA molecule, you've managed to survive the tar formation, the mm -hmm. stuff has been corroded by water but maybe not too much. Mm -hmm. You've got an RNA which does both folding and not folding. Now your problem is I want to get catalysis. And what I want to do is do catalysis to have more kids, right? Okay. So you want an RNA molecule that will synthesize RNA. Mm -hmm. you, but however, the minute you get catalysis, you can have destructive catalysts as well as constructive catalysts. So but actually, then, I can, then I can invoke in, uh, uh, natural selection. We have, yeah, but we have, we have statistics. If I just make random molecules of RNA, is it roughly one in 10 to the 14th will be an RNA molecule that destroys RNA, that catalyzes the destruction of RNA. Mm -hmm. Maybe one in 10 to the 33rd. And there's 20 orders of magnitude less likely as a molecule that constructively makes RNA. Mm -hmm. and these are numbers that are coming from experiments from labs who are trying yeah. to get RNA molecules that do both. So it's 10 to the 20th more likely for you to get from your prebiotic soup an RNA molecule that destroys RNA than one that makes RNA. But that's probably much like the ratio of mutations, the ones that are beneficial to the ones that aren't. Absolutely, absolutely. So, well, I mean, admittedly, you can tolerate 100 dead kids if you're a fruit fly and one living kid mm -hmm. as long as you have set up a relatively sophisticated process for having kids, 
right, we're talking about a prebiotic soup, right? So your problem right now is not, you're not you're not in an environment and life and life is getting started as you but, can afford. But wait a minute, you're jumping to a black and white scenario. I when, sure am. When when uh, mutations are we use the word beneficial and yeah. harmful, and you use mortal or <laughs> yeah. not. Right? Well, so can't yes. you nuance that a little bit in terms of RNA? Well, we would hope so, but I've give pick and picked you the two ends, right? The end point, something that hydrolyzes RNA, breaks it down to pieces, versus something that makes RNA that synthesizes. Now there's function in between, right? But I've just told you that it's 20 orders of magnitude more likely to get something that destroys RNA than something that makes RNA. All right, so you're setting up... pretty dim. But you're setting up almost straw man versions right. of what's preventing right. you from getting your... It's like you're excusing, you're, you're rationalizing your failure. <laughs> you're rationalizing your, your, I haven't succeeded yet. No, Is that what you're doing? I, we're playing a game. I'm telling you how you approach philosophically. This is an epistemological question. How do you approach philosophically a question where you don't have hypothesis-based research available to you? And the answer is, okay, don't tell me why you think life emerged. Tell me why you think it was impossible for life mm -hmm. to emerge. We play this game, okay. and that's and where you, these paradoxes come from. And then you try to overcome these it paradoxes. Focus issue. So, I Absolutely. I okay. So I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm. This book was written for my eighth grade son, right? As to how real scientists go about solving big questions where hypothesis-based research is not available to them. So, so from all this, this is philosophy. Stuff, but from all these things, you have, you have summarized everything by saying. I think 90% of these wet, rocky planets will have life. Well, that's Bayesian. That's, 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 an, that's, that's observing the world, applying Bayes' rule to... Wait, 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 wait. but that Bayesian prior has to include your assessment of how likely life is to arise, well, right? Well, we know that life arose. Here. We know. Here. Absolutely. So if I give I you... I know that English arose, too. If I give you four paradoxes, remember, these are not correctly spoken of as logical paradoxes, which for which there is no solution, right? But I've given you four apparent paradoxes. Mm -hmm. But I know, they say life could not have arisen, but I know that life did arise. I know there are resolutions to these paradoxes. At least in this... At least on Earth, that's right. At least in historical Earth. And so, yes, that's... So what we're saying is I'm trying to educate my eighth grade uh, science fair project class, I'm saying, hey, you want to address a big question. You don't want to ask, you know, are raindrops bigger when it rains with lower atmospheric pressure? A big question, right? How did life originate? And so the answer is you have a process by which you come up with reasons why you think it could not possibly. I have, it's a focus. I have a problem with the, because it's I keep on confounding things. life with something very, very, very quirky like English. And yeah. you keep assuming that it's something very, very generic associated with physics and chemistry. Yes, of course. And I keep thinking, well, you said, oh, what's the probability of life? And I say, well, what's the probability of Steve Benner? And you say, well, that's a different thing. And I, yes, I, I'm in my head, it, they become the same. I, conf I confuse them because here's the reason why. You know that in the, is the, you know the story of the Texan who said, uh, you know, there's Mexicans. They don't, they shouldn't, they keep on asking for Bibles in Spanish and if, English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it was good <laughs> enough for them. And yeah, the reason exactly. why that's relevant to this is that this text was so used to English, he thought English was everywhere. Yes. And so he thought it was a generic thing. Yeah. But English was a very, very specific thing, but it's just he had come used to it. So couldn't it be the case that life, in, instead of being generic, is a very, very specific thing, and we just pretend that it's generic, yeah. just like the text is pretending English is generic, or people with heads are pretending that heads are generic, but if you go back 600 million years, Heads are like species specific. I'm, I'm with you, Charlie. You're a physicist. You're familiar with the second law of thermodynamics. This is the question of aggregation. I say that among intelligent human beings, language is a certainty, English is a rarity. Why? Because I aggregate with language, French, German, English, Russian, Polish, and all the rest of them, as well as any of a million other languages which are not on Earth, which do not have any grammar or vocabulary that we know. We call those language. The aggregate, it's like saying that the pool where the bath has completely accelerated has got billions of individual states. If I could distinguish them, any individual states is rare. But the generic aggregate of all states where the pool is equal temperature from the deep end to the shallow end is common. Well, so not, not, if that pool, not if the pool is a set of measure zero, but if, if the whole pool could be... 
terribly quirky. And right. you just say, by the way, I can make it even quirkier by choosing a smaller part of yes, the quirky thing. that's right. So why So ribonuclease as a protein, as a phenomenon, is going to be common in biology, but a ribonuclease with a specific amino acid sequence, lysine, glutamic acid. Of course, no one would argue that, but we're, arguing, we're talking about whether life is common in the so universe. Life not is common, but my specific life, whether that's common or not, is an interesting question, which we can get to. Oh, we have a thought about that also. Right? <laughs> okay. right. So one of the questions you would ask is life is common, but since we're making the argument that it's common based on our Bayesian analysis of what happened here on Earth, mm. and we have all these paradoxes which we have to resolve within an Earth context, we actually would suspect that when we come up with resolutions, those resolutions will be based on chemistry and physics more or less unique to a rocky planet like Earth. Well, and therefore, lock, rock, life on a rocky planet around some distant star will have similar well, biochemistry. Well, English well. is also based on the rocky physics <laughs> that came out of Earth. Not really. English is contingent. It I bet you cannot have English anywhere in the universe if you don't have a rocky wet planet. <laughs> okay, that's for sure. <laughs> well, There's not a chance for English on a, uh, on a Jupiter. Well, that's, well, that's the point, point is, that's at the point. end of the day, sun will be called something different. <laughs> in whatever language is spoken. If you have one. Okay, there's here's another thing. Astrobiologists sometimes say, if we can find features among the life forms on Earth that have evolved independently, mm. then those features become the best candidates for the features we should expect elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? No. Why? Well, because you, even if they've evolved independently, they have a common starting point. So they haven't evolved independently. They haven't evolved independently. Okay. No. I, I suppose if you could do what Paul Davies would love to do, it, or, or Felisa Wolf Simon would like to do, is find a second alternative example of life on Earth that had a genesis different from you and me, we would we would have something to talk about. But right now, what we are seeing is independent evolution in different environments, and what you really see is the reworking of the same old parts to manage different needs for survival in different environments. So you disagree with Simon Conway Morris when he says if we replay the tape of life back to the Cambrian explosion, you, he thinks you will get something like human beings. Well, but Simon, remember, is looking at the level of physiology. So he looks at Tasmanian carnivores and marsupial and an Australian, mm -hmm. and he sees morphology. So a bat and a bird, although they do not share common ancestry in their flight motion, still have the same aerodynamic properties. And, and so he's talking about There's the convergence of the same physiology. two limbs that you just moved. But that's correct. But remember, remember, this is not convergent sequence evolution. The protein K-E-T-A-A-A-K-F-E-R-Q is 20 to a power. And that is an astronomical number, far larger than 10 to the 22, which is the number of planets we have mm -hmm. to work with in our solar system. So there is no sequence convergence on Earth even. That is, no two proteins that share similar amino acid sequences are coming by convergent sequence evolution. And the reason for that, and that's certainly true for low, what we call high information sequences, that certainly is the case just because the numbers are astronomical. So you're saying they're not sequence convergent, but they are what convergent? Function convergent. Functional yes, convergent. Right. Exactly. How can you say they're functional convergent when the basis of the function is the two four limbs that they both had in the common ancestor? The point and they're waving the two four limbs. Right, but the point is that you can get the aeronautic ratios that you need to fly from different pieces. Right, just like you can get proteins. Well, they're not that, using their noses or lips to fly. They're both using their forelimbs. Well, but you, you can't, you can, I, you know, I would defy you to come up with a continuous evolution where my lips could be used to fly. Well, I'd just suck on the well, bottom of Boeing 747, I suppose. I would, I would defy you to call independent any two sources of flight that rely on homologous organs. Okay, well, I mean, you can make the argument that bats and birds do share common ancestry, and so the fact that they chose the same sets of limb buds, shall we call them, to choose the fly is, is a well, they're both consequence. Yeah, that's right. They're a consequence of common ancestry, and they have bilateral symmetry. Perhaps it would be better to go to mosquitoes and, okay. and hummingbirds. They're both segmented. They're both animals. Well, they're, yeah, but at this point, they still have bilateral symmetry. They're still that. bilateral. Yes, I know yes. that. So, so, so bilateral is probably yeah. important for flight. Well, now let me think. I mean, is there a, do you know of a sl sl flying starfish? I don't know. <laughs> well, they're, they're a flying, flying sponge. sponge. I mean, there we go. Well, starfish, I think, are bilateral. 
No, they're, they're, they're radial symmetry. No, they're, they're not. They're bilaterals, I think. I, trust me, they're radial. <laughs> I, trust, I'm not, I won't trust you, but anyway. But, so this logic of trying to find independently evolved things you don't think flies very well. And yeah, I mean... To, to guess what's uh, elsewhere. I, I wouldn't. I mean, my view is that if life has emerged in any arbitrary environment and it's gotten to be multicellular, so it has this macro physiology, if it flies, it will have adapted to the same, uh, have, it would have the convergence in the sense that Simon Conway Morris sees convergence in Tasmanian versus placental animals, but it will have different detailed molecular bases. Do you mean marsupial rather than Tasmanian? Well, I, I, mean, I use Tasmanian because my favorite animal is the Tasmanian devil, and, and okay. I kind of thought he was always cute. But... Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? No. Yeah, I mean, everybody in your audience, I'm assuming, knows where Fermi's paradox is, which is fundamentally, if life is everywhere, why haven't we, why isn't it here, why haven't we encountered it? Now, I've already told you that life everywhere is microbial. So You said 90% of wet, rocky planets will have, have some kind of life, life, on, life microbial yes, life. Yes. So that's a problem for, I mean, it's not, that's an instant solution to Fermi's paradox because microbial life does not build spaceships. Well, you didn't travel. say what the probability you think of microbial life evolving into a spaceship. Yeah, but I've said to you that's quite low. Well, do you have any way to, how do, why do you say that? What's well, that's the Bayesian argument, right? You, you've, you've that's taken, just a prior, but what's your prior base? Though? But you've taken 90% of the life of the star to get to the point where you're able to build a spaceship. Oh, oh. Right? If you took twice as long, you I wouldn't see. have it, right? You'd be, okay. you'd be uh, you, you'd be toasted as the sun expanded to make Earth no longer habitable. Now, keep in mind that the, the Lisa Calden, we just had this discussion. Lisa is one of the American, well, she's German actually, great extrasolar planet people. And of course, she wants to look around brown dwarfs. Now, you know, as a cosmologist, all about brown dwarfs. So they, ha they live for 100 million years. They have, a, I'm sorry, 100 billion years, sorry. They have a long lifespan. And so she wants to look for intelligent life around these kinds of stars because they give you more time. Well, you don't mean M dwarfs, the lowest mass M dwarfs. Well, I, you tell brown me. brown dwarfs only burn deuterium, then they fade. Okay, but how long do they live? Well, live means burning. Yes. And burning, they don't burn hydrogen. They yes, just, but how long do they live? Very short time, oh. right. Well, what is Lisa telling me? The I, lowest mass M stars. Okay, that's what you're go. talking about. They're the 100 <laughs> <Right>. billion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You see, right. that's why I come to Australia, yes, okay. to, to talk to people like you. The question, are we alone, is that an important question? Well, I mean, how are you going to spend your life? I mean, big question, what am I going to have for lunch this afternoon? Uh, I mean, who do I marry? There are all sorts of much more constructive, imminent questions which are important to my happiness and well-being. But yeah, once you're going to get yourself into the big philosophical question, I think this is a bigger one then, you know, does God exist? That, that devolves into semantics often. But are we alone is one of the bigger questions which you can talk about. Yeah, I think it is quite important. So the bigger the question you're addressing, the more important it is. Well, constructively big... important is what I want to have for lunch today. That's a big question, <laughs> all right? Depends on whether you're starving or not, too, I guess. Absolutely, it depends on context. Well, well speaking of that, I, when I asked, um, when I gave an Indian student $100 billion yeah. to help answer the question, are we alone? I said, how are you going to spend it? And he said, uh, I'd spend it on poverty reduction. No. Because he thought, he said, well, it's not obvious that humans are going to stay alive. And if you want to, if you want to find aliens, you have to stay alive. So let's invest <laughs> in staying alive. Yeah. What do you think of that logic? Well, oh my goodness. You're going to ask me to opine about everything from Malthus to economics at this well, point. Well, I, I guess right. well, I'm giving you $100 billion. Yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, there's a great famine in the Sahel in the 1970s. He right? wasn't talking about local famine. He was talking about human species staying right. alive. Right. But the, the, I guess he was worried about everybody going dead. But dead. look, I mean, why was there a big famine in the Sahel? The answer was because the local governments insisted on the local tribes of making large amounts of cattle so they could export to make the government rich and that drained the reservoir so when the drought came along the economic system was unsustainable. Look, I mean, I, I of course love Malthus as a problem, right? And the Malthusian problem of populations growing exponentially and therefore ending up in perpetual starvation has been sort of solved by this combination of demographic transition, right? That is, you don't go from having 20 children to having two children. 
through technology and through civilization. And, you know, in principle, if the demographic transition were worldwide and if technology were worldwide and we managed energy, we built nuclear power plants, for example, so we didn't have to worry about carbon dioxide emissions quite so much, you could very easily have a uh, economic society that would be strong enough to keep the people alive as well as to ask these big questions. So you wouldn't invest any of your hundred billion in poverty reduction? Well, if I wanted to do poverty reduction, it would not involve investing a hundred billion dollars. It would be managing the structural <laughs> flaws that create that poverty. <coughs> and I assure you that putting a hundred billion dollars to creating poverty programs as we know in the United States, we have roughly the same amount of poverty as we had when we began the war on poverty. Okay. <laughs> and there are ways of addressing issues different than just spending the What money. kind of aliens would you like to find? It's the emotional question. Don't Obviously, forget your brain. Vulcans. That's You'd like to find Vulcans? Oh, absolutely. Vulcans, like yeah. Mr. Spock? Yes. Because Why? They would presumably instruct, they would presumably have solved all these cosmology problems that you worry about in your professional life and would just give us the answers so I could get on with it. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Spock is, is logical, but he's not omniscient. Well, okay, I mean, obviously, I would like to have an alien who is more elect intellectually and technologically advanced than mine, but not so interested in eating me. That would be sort of the criteria. Not one with beautiful woman that you have sex with or something. Like a lot of men go to Avatar you know, for the sexual thing. Uh, oh, well, that's a thought. No, I, I mean, if you, uh, no one has written a convincing book on the biology of Star Trek. We do have Larry Krauss down the street here at Arizona State who's written a book on the physics of Star Trek. How you get a Vulcan father and a, a, a human mother to give you Spock violate so many laws of biology. Yes, <laughs> but apparently no one cares about that. And Superman too, right? Oh, God Superman help us. with Lois Lane and yeah. Mork and Mindy. <laughs> yeah, well, so, so, you know, we, a horse and a donkey, when they mate, produce a, 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 a sterile species. The number of chromosomes, the incompatibility between a Vulcan and a human are such that Spock is not possible. So let me get it, the words of an authority. But I'm not looking for sex with an alien. Okay, but, but the, 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 the idea of a human being evolving independently on another planet, coming to Earth and then have, being able to have sex with no. females or males and, and for, as if it were the same species is absolutely impossible. Right. So if you have, you're familiar with allopatric and sympatric evolution, right? If I take a single population which is able to have fertile children together and separate them by geography for a million or two years, they cease to be able to... Sometimes longer than that. It might be up yes. to 10 million. Yeah, it's, it's, it's usually a little longer than that. That's okay. right. All right. Okay. So do you think, uh, thinking about the question, are we alone? and trying to figure out your place in the universe, you think that makes you a better person? I don't think I think about that question. I'll think about it now. Yeah, I'm not sure what a, a better person is. It certainly makes me a more happier person. It certainly makes me... Happier person? Yes. Well, the intellectual pursuit of big questions is a, has a certain sense of satisfaction to it. It gives you a purpose, right? <laughs> oh, is that, so that is your purpose? To, sure, to ask big questions and try to answer them? Absolutely. So you think the unexamined life is not worth living? Well, exactly. So I mean, I've already uh, fulfilled my obligations to my child's college trust fund, and so I can now move on to the bigger questions. Oh, okay. I'm retiring to the bigger questions <laughs> exactly. now that I've provided food. Okay. For the next generation. Well, uh, the reason why I ask that is because a lot of people don't care a damn about astrobiology. As a matter of fact, most people don't. And yeah. so I'd like to convince people that maybe they should. I don't know. I mean, I, I've gotten, every time I get into a taxi, I ask the driver, do you care if there's life on Mars? And about 50% of the time they say yes. So, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not. Well, NASA, of course, in the United States does provide highbrow entertainment, right? But 50% I mean, of the population already thinks we've discovered aliens. <laughs> well, is, that, is that what it is? Is that <laughs> what it is like in Australia? Or? <laughs> I think America is. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. I'm not either. I'm just no, but look, I mean, I mean, what do you do for entertainment, intellectual entertainment? You are a thinking being. You're a member of a thinking species. So well, the answer is you watch World Wrestling Federation or, you know, Survivor on CBS. But if you want a highbrow entertainment, you, you go to NASA. NASA provides to the American public and to the world 
a sense of adventure, a sense of participation in a bigger mission, a sense of exploration. And that's something that you can enjoy vicariously. You don't have to actually go out and be exploring Mars yourself. If you're part of the human endeavor that is exercising or engaging in that exploration activity, you're happy. It's quite an interesting, very, very human. Okay. Um, at a recent conference in NARA, you were on the stage and you asked, you said, oh, we want to know what's the least amount of information we need to make a life farm. Yes, I would uh, very you much. You and Joyce, I think, were asking this. Yes. And I heard you say that and I said, why does he think there's a, there is such a limit? Well... Why do you think there's a minimal life form? The reason why I was saying that because I said, where did the DNA, information of the DNA come from? Well, it comes from the environment. Mm. And, so if they, and so how much do you put into it? Well, an increasingly amount. Okay. So, so okay. there's a continuous variable. So why do you think there's a minimum? Well, because, I mean, Jerry in particular, Jerry Joyce is who we're referring to as a university. Well, he's, he, he used to be at the, the Scripps Research Institute. He now is at the Novartis um, Genomics Institute, um, had built systems which were able to replicate themselves and evolve. And there is a experiment that shows that a certain amount of information is able to do that. And when they tried to make smaller things, they failed to do that. Now, at some point you can ask whether the experiment was correctly run or whether it was run hard enough, they tried hard enough. But doesn't it small. all depend on how much you're willing to provide for the organism that you're evolving? No, no. The, the argument is that you must provide this minimum in order to get it to evolve and if you provide it less than that minimum it will not evolve. Mm -hmm. You have to provide the information then you stand back and then let the system mm -hmm. try to evolve. Okay, what do you think of Gaia as an idea, Gaia hypothesis? Well, as your, your audience understand what Gaia is? Well, you could give yeah, us so a 10 there is, there is this notion that the planet as a whole evolves where it, um, the planet makes life on it possible and life on the planet makes the planet able to do the reciprocal. Um, I'm much too much of a Darwinian. We view the unit of evolution as the individual, not the planet. There's no question that uh, the planet does respond to the biology that's on it and vice versa. And if there is a failure to respond, then that life form goes extinct. But I, I, I think that to go bigger than that in Gaia would not be what I would do. So you don't believe in group selection? Then? Oh, there certainly is group selection. But, but uh, not the largest group selection? But, well, no, I even believe that it might be the largest groups. There's an ecosystem that has to work as a whole, and that ecosystem can eventually have planetary ramifications. But to involve the planet itself in it is going to be a bit of an issue. Mm. Okay, and uh, now you've taught students about astrobiology. What do you think the, their biggest misconceptions about astrobiology and the question, are we alone? I don't think we've had much misconceptions. I think the problem in teaching students is to make them acquire, I mean science as you know is, is difficult. You don't just, well maybe you did when you first did your first differential equations, but I'm assuming you had to work at it and you were at some level motivated to work at it and so what astrobiology provides is the motivation to do all the hard learning of chemistry or math or physics that's required to actually make contributions where you suffer through the the learning curve knowing that once you get to the end of it you can do something that you think is quite interesting so that so that's you say that is a misconception that no no i think that's our problem i don't think our problem is uh, is, is with students and teaching them is is at the end of that story. I don't think we have to worry about them being enthusiastic about the wrong things, right? Our problem as teachers is to try to get them to go up that learning curve. And getting up that learning curve involves no preconceived notions about what the subject is? No, I mean, what motivates what I, told you? I, mean, I don't know, when you went up the physics learning curve, did you just walk in and say, oh, this math is easy, and then get on with it? No, but I was highly impressed by how much I had to unlearn in order to learn <laughs> yeah. something better. And so I had to unlearn yeah. this and unlearn this. I was taught all these things, oh, and all these things I had assumed. And yeah. then I made I progress say. only after I got rid of the assumptions that... It, I'm with you. So you're asking what the assumptions yes, are that yes. we have to unlearn when, yes. we, get, when we go into astrobiology. Yes. 
Well, yeah, I have to think about that. I don't know a good answer to that question. I can think of, I can think of many student-specific things. Right. Well, you so, must work with postdocs rather than pre-docs or something. Well, I've worked with, uh, I, I, I go over and will go to the high school on international baccalaureate program on theory so, of knowledge. So your son, for example, eighth grade, yeah. what are the misconceptions he has that, you, that you've had to... Oh, he's perfect, of course. <laughs> of course, he's no longer in eighth grade, so that's... Right. <laughs> right. No, no, I, it's, it's interesting. It's different for each individual student. I mean, that's part of the individuality of teaching, is you do try to have to identify in each individual student what the obstacles are, right? And then all of a sudden you realize what they are, and then if you're, if you're successful as a teacher, you can you know, say a few sentences to correct that misconception. You know, I don't, that's a very good question. I, I, so I'd have to think about whether there are not individual student specific, but, but you know, I mean, going through just teaching the elements of organic chemistry, right? I mean, one of the things that's wrong with how organic chemistry is taught and that's a misconception, I guess you could argue, that is quite obstructive, is a focus on memorization of, meta, of pathways as a way of preparing the students for their medical entrance examinations, for example. And so one certainly has to learn a lot of that in, in an engineering sense. But otherwise, the, the misconceptions are very student-specific. Okay. And uh, advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Oh dear! I mean, the, uh, there's always career oh advice. Dear, what kind of <laughs> right. Oh dear! Well, there's career advice, right? So your question mm. is: So my son graduated with a degree in history and philosophy of science and medicine. Now the question is: Can your dad? You ask the question: Can you get a job with that degree? So that would be the problem for astrobiology, right? So one of our major questions, and this is true in funding of science overall, science is a capital investment that is important in medicine, it's important in technology, but it's a capital investment means you're investing now to do research that will pay off much later. And that's a very common in medical research where we are only today realizing 50 years later the, recombinant, the value of the recombinant DNA technology that was laid out in the 1960s by people who were really not thinking about medical applications at all. So one of your first, pro I mean, astrobiology, if anything, has an even longer time scale in terms of the knowledge, being able to generate something of value that would be able to justify or amortize the cost of creating that knowledge. So your first problem with astrobiology, if you're advising astrobiologists in a career, is to ask, where do they sit? Where do they feel that they would fit into a job market? And that's a really nuts and bolts kind of question. The other thing is you really have to ask is whether they think that they can make a constructive, unique, intellectual contribution to a field. And, you know, for a student, it's really hard to know that until you're well along in your career where you fit into the bigger picture. In the movie Contact, you've yes. seen that. Absolutely. At the, at the end, a child, a boy of 10 or 12, yeah. asks Jodie Foster, mm -hmm. the character, are we alone? Yes. And Jody waste of space. Yes. yes. She says, well, if we are, it's a really big waste of space. Yes. What do you think of that comment? Well, that's, of course, it's this teleological comment, which we don't allow <laughs> into our way of thinking, right? There's the Dr. Manhattan and, and you know, uh, the watchmaker, right, where he goes to Mars and he says, life is overrated. Here's a planet that's got along perfectly fine without it. <laughs> so, so that's sort of the other, the other anti jody Foster view of the world. Mm -hmm. We do think that life is important because we're alive and, and we're not likely to go along with Dr. Manhattan. And so that's just a self-serving comment? It, it's better that we exist? It is a human-centric, human perspective, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, it's not an answer to the kid's question. The kid asks you a yes or no question, Jody. You're supposed to tell him yes or no. <laughs> or we don't know. That would be also appropriate if that were the case. Oh. How about the idea, so sometimes I accuse SETI people of looking for God. And in other yes. words, they're looking for you know, somebody, they describe, oh, we're hoping to find an alien that can answer that's all right, our that's problems, that's and right. they know everything, and, then, and I said, well, that sounds like God to me. Yeah, that's why I want Vulcans. I mean, that was my... But so you're looking for God. Oh, I, it would be very nice to have a superior intelligence that would shortcut 
the process by which we learn about reality. But usually God is, is used by people as some type of moral standard and the creator of the universe. And yeah. when I talk to scientists about it, no, it's, the, it's a scientist. God is a scientist. Looking for an encyclopedia, right? Yeah. God the encyclopedia. It's a different kind of God. It's definitely not a moral one. They don't say, oh, I'm hoping to find an alien that can help me be more moral. I hardly ever... No, but, I've never heard that actually. But occasionally they say, I'll solve our society's problems. Yeah. I hear that, though. Well, absolutely. I mean, there is the day the Earth stood still, right? This science fiction movie where the alien comes down and says, you better behave or we're going to do nasty things to you, which I've always thought was a, um, a somewhat hypocritical approach to child rearing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Isn't that, wait, isn't that what don't guilt, beat on your brother? I'll religion, beat you. <laughs> isn't that what religious guilt trips and threats of hell are about? You are, yeah, yes. I mean, that's one of, but that's of course one of the Lutheran problems, right? Well, I mean, not only Lutheran Catholics have that problem. Well, yeah. but Luther pointed out if the only reason why you're good is because you don't want to go to hell, then you're not being good. Right. right? right, right. So, okay. so this is a paradox. But yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't worry about these questions. These questions are beyond my pay grade, and, and of course, a lot of other people. But I've been, you've told me that you're a Quaker, for example. Is that, well, I, was, I was, went through eight, uh, 12 years of Quaker education. Now, uh, is that, do you think of anything to do with your worldview on aliens? And I'm sure it does. I mean, but I, you don't know how. You can't, you can't well, it, it makes me a little on the pacifist side. I <laughs> don't much like capital punishment. I mean, there's, there are these things that you can't go through 12 years of this interaction without having some impact impact on your worldview. But, so, uh, but I mean, but what's interesting about Quakerism is that, of course, it's not a particularly, well, there is no priesthood, there is no canon, there is no scripture, there is nothing associated with the, so you, you can go to get the Apostles' Creed if you're a good Catholic, and uh, there's nothing like that. So there's an interesting question as to what you mean when you say you're, you're, you've been trained as a Quaker. Well, Stephen Hawking thinks we should keep our head down and not broadcast because to give away our presence to aliens because he makes the calculation um, there have been lots and lots of Earth-like planets yep. that have been formed before the sun yes. and so on average these civil if there are civilizations they're a billion or two billion years more advanced and therefore it's like us looking to amoebas. We don't give, give much credence to amoebas. We just kill them without even thinking about it. So therefore, the aliens will kill us without thinking about it if they knew we were here. Uh, so therefore, uh, he says we should keep our head down. Now, as a Quaker, would you say, you know what? No, no, those aliens are going to be Quakers, and they'll be very pacifist. Yeah, there you go. Is that what you? <laughs> well, that that's the argument, right? The argument, and even Jodie Foster in her character makes that argument. Ellie Haraway that if you are advanced, you have, and especially if you're gallivanting around the galaxy, you have met your physical needs, and you don't need to eat other people. You would come here as an archaeologist or an anthropologist, so the aliens would come here if they're that advanced, like Margaret Mead goes to the South Pacific, okay? So that would be the issue. Right? And spread smallpox or something. Well, if, you know, I mean, <laughs> The odds that you can bring a uh, parasite from another alien independent genesis and have it affect, I mean, smallpox goes from camels yeah, to right, humans, right. So it doesn't infect frogs, right, okay? Right, so, right, I mean, right, right. so I this it. idea that a virus will be able, will coming from, from Vulcan that will decimate the Earth's population is quite unlikely. Um, speaking of viruses, are viruses alive? Well, <laughs> For those of us, the answer is yes, and, and, and the, for us who view the Darwinian feature of a replicating system as the touchstone of being alive, yes. Are memes alive? Well, <laughs> no, they're not chemical. They, they have to be chemical. Self-assembly, yes, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution is alive. That's, so you stick well, to that definition then? I do. No, I find that quite a sad. Say, say it again. I find that a no, quite. Say, oh, say the, uh, life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Self-sustaining. Yes, which means not doesn't mean you don't need to eat, but you can go out and find your own food. You don't need someone to feed you. You don't need someone to That's feed right. you. Yes. So if I put you and your wife in this hermetically sealed capsule, you'd die rather That's than. That's what the why the word system is used. So the baby and the mother are a system that's self-sustaining. The baby is not. Wait, but, but you need system. to breathe oxygen. 
the right. oxygen has to be part of the system too. Yes. Yeah. Well, so you have to have other life forms in there. You have so to be able to self. Well, you have to know how to find your own oxygen. Now, well, it's given to you by other life forms. So we're not parasites on other life forms. Well, you eat. You, uh, but you don't. Uh, you don't eat. Food but be is careful. made by other life forms. But, but let's work through parasitism, right? Parasitism is a one-way directional thing. So. Yeah, when you grow corn, which makes oxygen, and then you eat the corn, and then um, you burn the corn using the oxygen that the corn created, that's a net cycle that balances, right? But the neither corn you didn't nor the parasite. The, the cyanobacteria was, created the 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. Oh, to start with. Well, and you didn't yes. do anything for the cyanobacteria. But we're bacteria. sustaining, right? Exactly. We're sustaining. Okay. We're, we're, I mean, admittedly, the planet. And there's, there's your Gaia. The planet did have the ability to set you up with the cornfield, okay. but you sustain. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable <laughs> from, from magic. magic yes. And then a guy named Carl Schroeder says, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Hello. So in other words, there will be tree-hugging, self-sustaining, yeah. ecologically thinking aliens that yes. will not, uh, you know, Take a chainsaw to the whole planet, and or to create right. wonderful technology that's obviously there, but rather it will be more sustain, yes. more like nature. What do you think of that? People who are in the business of writing literature are skilled at turning literary phrases. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had to dissect the Clark statement about magic, I would have to delve into what do you mean by magic? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, look, it's an interesting question. I ask physicists all the time this question. Is quantum mechanics the end of the story? Or will we have another revolution like we had 100 years ago mm -hmm. where all of a sudden everything is recognized as being approximately correct and in some sense a correspondence between what we thought. But will quantum mechanics be the end of the story? And most physicists, by the way, will tell me, no, it's the end of the story and they will give oh, me reasons mm -hmm. why. But this is the question that you're really asking, right? right? If you believe that that we would be unable to explain to a human the physics of the alien who visits us, who must have better command of physics because they visit us as opposed to us visiting them, right? That you will be unable to acquire that knowledge because you'll be like a cargo cult and all you will see whenever the Americans set up their radio system that you think you can duplicate it with a cardboard box and a vine. <laughs> Right? Well, the Australians had some experience with these people as well and, and in Australian territories in that part of the world. Then you're talking Arthur C. Clarke language. But it's an interesting question, right? If you encounter an alien and he is able to do magical things, will you, try, will you respond as a cargo cult does? That's a good question. I would like to think that no, I would understand that there's some physics I don't understand. But we had this question under the Templeton Fund. The Templeton World Charity Foundation had a big thing, and you know, here we were gathered together deciding whether artificial intelligence should be avoided because computers were going to take over, the, and, and we should be like Stephen Hawking, suggest quiet so that no one comes and eats us. So, and oh, this is uh, no, this is Martin Rees. No, this is the Astronomer Royal, a very, very prominent person. So, you know, I started to look. Martin, he said, oh, maybe there's physics we don't know. So I said, look, Martin, the only physics that's important that we don't know that would have bearing on our interaction with aliens would be something that lets us travel faster than the speed of light because that's why we can't explore it. So do you believe that that will ever go down? And then, unfortunately, Martin then proceeded to give me a long discourse on you know, wormholes and uh, sort of... No, I don't want to know that. I want different physics. So will, at the end of the day, quantum mechanics survive? Will, at the end of the day, these, con these relativistic concepts of, of... Because that's what prevents us from traveling, right? And exploring, right? At some point, if, we'll, so will we ever encounter physics which is so far advanced that what we think to be solid premises will be magical in their violation? And Clark says yes, but most of the physicists I know will come up with proof that quantum mechanics is the only way to structure our understanding of the universe. And I don't know which side of the... I would ask you this question if you were not doing the interview, but the, the question is, where, where, where do we sit here? Mm -hmm. Because what 
you know, admittedly, every every human civilization has thought they had a pretty good beat on things, right? And so we may just be another example of somebody who thinks that we're having, you know, doing pretty well. But you got to tell me, are the big things in physics not travel faster than the speed of light, which would greatly change our ability to encounter aliens, or quantum mechanics, which greatly changes our view of the universe? If, are any of those ever going to be in jeopardy? And if that's the case, then Clark is correct. On the other hand, if you believe that we've gotten a good beat on things, and this is the last time we're going to have these revolutions. Well, a lot of people, no we're, at a, magic. we're at a conference here. A lot yeah. of people are concerned with exoplanets and the habitability right. of these exoplanets. Absolutely. On the other hand, Reese, Martin Reese yes. and, and Paul Davies have said, well, you know, once you get technologically, you create machines, you don't need, you're not biology anymore. Yes. And so, it, and that's maybe 99 or 99.9999% 99 of the lifetime of a civilization. Yes. And yet we keep on insisting on planets. So yeah. why is this, are we all just barking up the wrong tree? Yeah, well, this is what's wrong with the def definition of life being self-sustainable, self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Because you have actually acquired a form of Lamarckian evolution, and once you start being able to modify the DNA in your germ lines, you actually will have bona fide Lamarckian evolution. Well, didn't don't bacteria have bona fide Not Lamarckian really. evolution? No. Well, sure they do. No, they, they say, do. hey, I want to eat some genes, give me those genes mm -hmm. over here. There is no prospective evolution in bacteria, period. They may acquire genes randomly and then maybe decide that they're useful for fitness, but that process of acquiring cannot be prospective and is not prospective. Well, who cares whether with respect respect to there's intentionality fitness. there or not? Well, but you have it here, right? You, well, I, I you and I, I don't believe in free will. I don't believe in free will. No, but you and I do Lamarckian evolution, especially if we sure, sure. do gene therapy, right? If I do gene therapy, I know what that if I remove my hemophilia gene, I will be better fit. So well, CRISPR, can, bacteria use CRISPR. Well, they don't do it prospectively with respect to fitness. Suspect, with the word perspective? That is, they make the variation knowing that it is going to help them be more fit in the future. You so, do that. You do that. So you, so you, so who, does my dog do that? Well, no. So humans only are the only ones who do That's it. That's correct. Who told you that? <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. <laughs> there's a big source of... I mean, of there's a big issue in engineering. <laughs> so how is it that you build a... Fact. How did you How did you build the Clovis point, uh, spearhead, right? Well, the answer is you randomly made spearheads, and then the guy who had the correct spearhead was able to kill his neighbors and pass yeah, that How did you head. choose 21 or 20 amino acids? You yeah. randomly chose amino acids, and then the guy that's who... correct. Yes. So, I mean, that's how everything works. No. Well, so the question is, you, works. when the engineer builds the Boeing 747, right, do they randomly throw parts together? And yes, just, the <laughs> engineers who <laughs> throw parts together are no longer with us. So, <laughs> so well, that's Believe the engineers me. will tell you no, that we don't get to the 747 <coughs> by randomly assembling. That's because they're the ones who failed the test. All the ones who would randomly fill it are failed all the tests well, that they had to you, acquire you, to become an engineer. You know that's, well the engineer, but you know damn well because of the combinatorial space that the Boeing 747 was done by prospective engineering. I, I, I disagree completely, but that's maybe we should, so, we should do that off. Yes, so you think yes. that people threw together pieces of nuts and bolts randomly and got something that would fly? That's how everything works. <laughs> that's how everything works. Well, not, 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 so in any case, your <laughs> gene therapy will be prospective. It will be Lamarckian. Okay. Now you can ask okay. the question, well, Stephen, you just gave right. me a definition right. of Darwinian evolution, and then what you'll tell me is that humans are about to no longer be life. Right, well, anyway, but this question about life forms becoming Robotic. space robots, yes. right? Yeah, then, so that's right. So the bottom line will be that when you achieve true Lamarckian evolution, right, you will be able to expand past your habitable zone. Why? Well, because you are no longer requiring random variation followed by natural selection to get you able to adapt to a new environment. You can identify the new environment and then by a process that does not involve random variation, construct your life form to fit, be fit but, for that environment. But there is random Lamarckian evolution. Well, like the horizontal little, gene transfer, yeah, I mean, for Lamarckian example. Lamarckian and Darwin have many, many definitions yes, they in do, the popular literature as well. But the distinction that we're making is one where the variations, what you build, 
you know in advance will make you more fit. Well, that's what, when you make your sperm, you do the same thing. There no, are hot you, spots during recombination. It does not randomly I assure combine you, like that. I assure you that there is no perspective variation in those hot spots. Of course there is. No. Of course there is. No, there okay. isn't. All right, we'll have to talk about that. We'll argue with that a bit later on. All right, now, are we alone? Uh, we have other microbes in the galaxy with a 90% probability that at 9 out of 10 of the rocky exoplanets that we discover will likely have microbes. That's a number. And, but so I do believe sure. that they're very scarce that we have intelligent life. Very, very scarce. So you think you're pretty sure that we're not alone in the universe if there's at the a level of biology, that's correct. And in terms of techno civilizations? And we're quite likely quite alone. Remember, there's a gym, there's a distance parameter here. How far do you have to go to find uh, an intelligent life form? So I'm telling you, you go to the next star which has a rocky planet, you have a 90% chance of finding microbes of independent genesis. You go, however, at least across the galaxy, halfway across the galaxy, perhaps not to the next galaxy before you find life form that is intelligent. And that means able to build telescopes. Uh, build, yes, able to talk to you. Let's let's just be small. Let's be, let's be. As we would put you in the same room, we would not both speak English. We've already settled that question. But you would be, you would be, you would understand and recognize that the person across the table was sentient, and you would make an effort to talk to that person. I do that with my dog. Yeah, I that I, I, I'm prepared to say that dog is intelligent, but not linguistic. Some people do you, this with trees. They don't do it with, uh, they suffer from an illusion. <laughs> <laughs>